Hello, everybody. So we are looking at chapter 13, Mid-Ocean Rifts, and I'm going to show you a couple of slides just very, very briefly. Uh, I'm going to keep these videos short because they are uh, very memory intensive and so they're not easy to upload on Canvas otherwise if they're much longer. Um, the key slides in chapter 13, the key figures are these. This one is a map that shows the extent of the Mid-Ocean Ridge system. This red line uh, that goes around through the Atlantic and um, Indian Ocean and Pacific Ocean, etc. These yellow arrows are vectors. So the longer the arrow, then the faster the spreading rate. So you can see here uh, the spreading between the Nazca plate over here and the Pacific plate over here is amongst the, is, is, it looks like it's the fastest spreading rate uh, on the planet, where, whereas up here in the North Atlantic we have very slow spreading rates. There's about 90,000 kilometers worth of mid-ocean ridge. That's enough to circle the globe a couple of times. Very extensive system. All of the stuff in blue is created at the mid-ocean ridge. And that blue material is it's underlain by basalt or oceanic crust. That is two-thirds of Earth's surface. So most of Earth's crust is made through this mid-ocean ridge system. All right, so here are what spreading rates look like. It's not too important to know the precise numbers, but just in terms of ballpark, they range from a little bit less than a centimeter per year. Here's uh, 0 0.6 at the northern edge of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, up to about six centimeters per year it would be part of the East Pacific rise that we saw in um, those longer yellow vectors in the Pacific. All right, uh, this is what uh, how mid-ocean ridges are drawn in map view. Uh, we have a spreading center here, and then it's offset by a transform fault, and it links up to another spreading center. And this is showing the same thing, a spreading center, a transform fault, and then another spreading center. Uh, here the author is showing these things called devals, deviation from axial linearity. It's a bend in the ridge. Um, they're not really very important unless you're actually doing research in, in, in uh, ocean, uh, these kinds of oceanic systems. So don't worry too much about that. Here's what they look like in cross-section. This is a terrific figure uh, in your book. Uh, if we go th uh, through the crust, uh, the lava flows, the, the pillow basalts and sediments would be here. And then we would go through a layer of sheeted dikes. There would be a lens of melt just below uh, the, the ridge axis. This axis is where new crust is being created. These are old ridges that are created sometime in the past. This ridge here would be the same part, uh, same age as this guy here. That's why they're colored in the same way. So there's that, that symmetry that we would also see in um, the magnetic lineations. These dikes, this sheeted dike system, uh, are a record of that melt being transported up through to the surface. And then here's the mantle. The mantle is being partially molten and filling up this area with partial melt. It's called a transition zone because it's really a transition from material that's solid to the mantle that's partially molten. Uh, and it's partially molten itself. Uh, it has a special S-wave velocity to it. We'll look at that in a moment. These gabbros are the solidified portion of this material. So not all of this melt or mush gets transported to make a volcanic rock at the surface. Some of that melt gets left behind, and what gets left behind crystallizes to form a gabbro. So we get the sequence out uh, away from the axis of mantle, gabbro, dikes, pillow basalts, and then the sediment that, are, that is sitting on top. And so that vertical section is being produced by this activity here of partial melting, the creation of a mush, mush the segregation of the melt, and then its eruption through dikes up to the surface. We have an understanding of mid-ocean ridges through our look at ophiolites. Now, ophiolites are bits of oceanic crust that have been obducted, not subducted, but obducted, OB, uh, onto Earth's surface. And so we get this geological view of what we think the ocean crust looks like. So here are deep sea sediments, pillow basalts, there's the sheeted dike complex, the gabbros. Uh, the gabbros come in several types. There's 
Isotropic just means they're, there's no fabric to it. Foliated means that they have kind of like a metamorphic fabric, the foliations we talked about in the, the last day of class uh, a couple Wednesdays ago. And then the layered gabbros uh, that are part of this deeper part of the gabroic system here. And then all of that is sitting on top of mantle. Now, this is mantle that's had melt extracted out of it. So this is the moho right here. That, that line that cuts across here. This is the oceanic crust, which is about six to eight kilometers thick. And then below that line is the mantle. Some very nice diagrams in your book relate these layers, the sediments, pillow lavas, etc., to what we see in the seismic um, uh, velocities. Uh, the moho here, this, the boundary between the layered gabbros and the layered peridotites, uh, there is a jump in uh, P-wave velocity from about 7 to 8 kilometers per second. That's a pretty big jump. And so when we're looking at uh, P-wave velocities, anything greater than 8 uh, kilometers per second usually indicates that we are looking at material in the mantle. Uh, there are a couple of slides here that your author shows. This one is pointing out the thin pelagic layer. Then we have layers 2A and B. These designations here, 2A and B and layer 2C, that comes out of geophysical estimates where the geophysicists, they don't see the rock type. All they know about their so-called layer 2A is that it has these velocities. So when they see velocities of from two to six kilometers per second, they call it 2A, 2B, and they're not really specifying what the rock type is. It's our geologists looking at ophiolites that have been abducted on the land that start telling, giving us insights about how layers 2A and 2B could be the sheet of dike complex or pillow basalts. And then below that, we have layer 3A and 3B. Uh, this is layer three is effectively the gabbros. These have uh, velocities of seven kilometers per second. And then um, uh, this is not, I'm going to skip over this slide. There's not a lot that's really important here. As these melts crystallize, they form these differentiated things called plagiogranite. It's basically a plagioclase rich granite that would look a lot like what we saw on the field trip. Um, to the Mount Gibbons area, but it's lacking in quartz. Uh, and then layer four, the stuff with eight kilometer per second P-wave velocities is the mantle that they're showing that with this red arrow here. And there's no real bottom to this. This goes down for hundreds of kilometers. Now, coming back to the pillow lavas, the stuff that's erupted, uh, this diagram here shows the compositions We'll look at this in another exercise in Excel we'll, we'll, where we will do some plotting and uh, modeling of the um, major oxides. But notice that the silica content is fairly constant whether we're looking at the Mid-Atlantic Ridge or the East Pacific Rise or the Indian Ocean. All over the ocean basins have very similar silica contents, about 50 weight percent. MGO is about 7.5 weight percent. So this mid-ocean ridge system here that goes around the globe makes uh, a very homogenous kind of material. Whether we're making crust here or over here or over there, it all ends up being very similar. So all this blue stuff is very similar in composition. And that's shown here in this slide. All right, the last slide that's probably worth giving a little bit of attention to is this figure. And it, this is just showing uh, I, I like these figures down here, a cross-section of the topography of a mid-ocean ridge. The mid-Atlantic mid ridge spreads at a much slower rate, 21 millimeters per year or 2.1 centimeters per year, and you have a pronounced valley at the axis. So this is where the newest material is being uh, erupted. And that's because the spreading rate is slow enough that allows normal faults along the boundaries of these to allow a depression to develop. But if spreading is very fast, then there's faster rates of eruption and we have um, a much more subdued topography. And that's it.